And finally tonight, a new book explores the history and spread of AIDS in Africa. Ray Suarez has our conversation. Since AIDS was first identified in the West 30 years ago, its toll across the world has been vicious. It's killed 25 million people since 1981, an estimated 34 million are living with the virus today. Just how the disease began and spread perplexed scientists for years. A new book tracks the emergence of the HIV virus out of a remote part of Cameroon to what is now Kinshasa in the former Belgian Congo. Tinderbox, how the West sparked the AIDS epidemic and how the world can finally overcome it, connects the economies and atrocities of colonialism to that initial outbreak and to current medical approaches to the treatment and prevention of HIV in Africa. Craig Timberg and Daniel Halperin, welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. The book is about a great many things, but one of the conclusions that's gotten a lot of attention is the responsibility of colonialism for helping AIDS break out of the deepest rainforest into the rest of the world. How does that happen? Well, the virus that became HIV was infecting a community of chimpanzees for hundreds of years, probably thousands of years. And scientists now theorize that it actually made its way into the human population several times over centuries as, as humans caught infected chimps, butchered them, the blood probably passed through a cut. What's crucial about the moment that leads to the actual AIDS epidemic is that at that exact moment, there are new intrusions of steamships and porter paths as humans move into these remote places where the chimpanzees lived. And it's at that moment when, uh, when HIV becomes a human epidemic, starts moving down the rivers and into the, into the um, birthplace of the epidemic, if you will, in, in Central Africa. And even to this day, um, there are small strains of HIV virus that exist. For example, in Cameroon, there are more strains of the virus than anywhere else in the world. And some of these strains probably originated during the last century, or in other words, are more recent than the strain that's caused over 99% of the deaths of, by AIDS in the world. So we hypothesize that if it hadn't been for the role of colonialism, that what we now know today as the type of HIV virus that's become this huge global problem might likely have become like these other strains we've seen in Cameroon, may have gone out and infected a few hundred or a few thousand people, but we may never even have known about it because it's a fairly remote part of the world. And this is a place that was one of the most sparsely populated parts of a very sparsely populated continent. And so were it not for the intrusions of colonialism, uh, it's, it's unlikely that the epidemic we know today would have, would have come out in the way that we've seen it. And uh, in particular, that they've been able to track porter paths where Africans are, are force marched through the jungle. They're carrying guns and ivory tusks and rubber. They've, they've been able to track that to exactly the place where these chimpanzees lived. And there would have been no reason for those people to go there before. They went there because they were forced to go there. And they come down these porter paths, they go to these trading stations, they get on steamships, and that becomes the actual spark for this epidemic. We can now see in retrospect that this was going on. And that perhaps gives us a little bit insight, hopefully, into how to approach the problem today. That as Westerners, we are not merely um, bystanders who uh, care in, about what happened in Africa. But in a sense, we have a little bit, perhaps, of responsibility to help remedy a situation that we may have partly helped to have initiated. What happened? in later decades, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, to allow HIV to become so deeply rooted in Africa and also break out to the rest of the world? The two really important things happen uh, in the middle part of the 20th century. One is that HIV makes its way on the railroads, on the highways, into the parts of Africa where male circumcision, which is an ancient tradition in much of the continent, is not in fact a tradition. So when you cross over the mountains, and you're suddenly in East Africa, you're in the areas where men aren't circumcised, and suddenly, instead of having infection rates of 1%, 2%, you get infection rates of 5%, 10%, 15%. You see the kind of disaster that we're more familiar with, where, where entire villages um, you know, lose you know, a, a huge percentage of their adults. And that kind of problem also moves into Southern Africa, where also you have lower rates of male circumcision. And the other crucial thing that happens, the HIV makes its way to the Americas. It makes its way from from Kinshasa uh, in the 1960s to Haiti. Uh, and that's where 
eventually it, it, it works its way into the Americas, it works its way into the gay um, American population, and it spreads much more widely eventually. But the shadow of colonialism is never really gone from Africa, is it? When it comes to the way we look at AIDS, look at AIDS sufferers, talk about and to the people who are HIV positive, um, how, how do you explain that part of it in your book? We believe, of course, that the, the, the Europeans and North Americans and other foreigners who are in Africa now and other places trying to help people with this epidemic are, in one sense, completely different from the colonial uh, the colonials who were there a hundred years ago. They're not there to, to rape and to plunder, so to speak. Um, they're there with good intentions. They want to help uh, deal with this and other diseases. But there's unfortunately a little bit of a kind of uh, paternalism or a hubris maybe that, that continues, a sense of we're the experts, we, we know what to do. There's been a lot of uh, coverage in the book of the sort of condescending, paternalistic, tisk tisk way of looking at African societies where people were changing their behavior and not getting much credit for it. When you look at what happened in societies when they faced this problem, several of them you know, sort of put, did the math, right? They were faced with an incurable disease, it was spread by sex, it was fatal. And in several societies, the leaders of the societies, politicians, singers, religious leaders, led campaigns that, in which they said, you know, if we're going to survive, we need to make changes in our, our own sexual behaviors as a society. And that ends up being enormously consequential when you're dealing with a sexually transmitted epidemic. You don't have a lot of love for uh, the efforts to use high-tech responses, in particularly in the African epidemic, uh, whether it's antiretrovirals or um, universal uh, urging to use condoms, uh, sort of technical fixes uh, don't really uh, get a lot of praise in this book, and, and I think you conclude that they're not going to work in the African context. These well. drugs are miraculous, right? This medicine uh, brings people back from the edge of death, and anyone who's watched that happen understands the power of that, and we want as many people to be treated as possible. I mean, what the issue we raise is it's, it's not enough to treat people who already have this virus. The, to, to really win the fight against the epidemic, you need, to pre you need to prevent the next million, the next 10 million infections from happening. And now drugs may play a role in that, but we think that the most powerful role in the end will be played by the kinds of things we're talking about here, changes in sexual behavior, incre increasing the prevalence of, of male circumcision, and, and the his that's what history shows. The book is Tinderbox, How the West Sparked the AIDS Epidemic and How the World Can Finally Overcome It. It's a pretty, pretty big ambition in that title. <laughs> Craig Timberg and Daniel Halperin, thank you both. Thank, thank you, you Ray. Ray. This was wonderful. Thank you.